And now, without further ado, I'm very happy to announce, here comes Hakan Bulgulu, the chief executive of Archilic. You won't like what you're going to hear. Turn off your air conditioners in this blistering heat. Like the French would say, wash only parts of your body when you shower, or shower with cold water. Unplug your appliances when you're not using them. Don't drive, ride a bicycle. All of these things you're hearing European politicians everywhere speaking today, but not for the right reasons. Welcome to modern-day Europe. We are in a world significantly different than when I last gave the keynote speech in 2019. In 2019, we were on the back of the longest period of growth human history has seen. We created wealth. We brought people out of poverty. Yes, the environment was in a difficult situation, and I was still talking about the climate. I mean, I went and climbed Everest to make a point. But today, we're in a vastly, vastly different world. Today, Inflationary outlook in my country, Turkey, is common. We, live, we have lived with inflation for many generations. But now, Europe is actually, for the first time, tasting the bitter medicine. 9.1% headline inflation is something Europe has not seen since the Second World War. These newspaper headlines are real. They're depressing. Interest rates are rising. Capital is becoming scarce. Jobs will become difficult people's disposable income is going to go down. China's zero-COVID policy, zero policy has put pressure on supply chains. We all run businesses. There's scarcity of supply, components, massive increases in logistics costs, massive increase in material costs. And yet, Europe's energy prices deepens every single day. The global meltdown is disrupting economies everywhere. And yet, the hottest topic in the planet is actually the heating planet. As you all know, Europe has faced its worst drought in hundreds of years. The Rhine is at its lowest level it's been, at least in memory of many generations. Germany conducts about 80 billion euros of trade transporting through these riverways. We are seeing the, uh, the Alps and the glaciers melting everywhere in the world. I mean, even you know, Everest, the Kumbu Glacier is melting by a meter a year. They're ha having to move in Nepal the base camp because of the melt. The Alps will probably lose about 80% of their glaciers by the end of the century. They've already lost half of them, by the way. It's not like it's going to happen in the future. Today, it is happening everywhere we look. The most dramatic of all, the Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the world. You know what that means? That means the white cover over the caps of the world is decreasing at such a rate that we are not reflecting the same amount of radiation into space. The oceans are having to absorb much more carbon and heat than they have ever before in the past, and the results are absolutely catastrophic. The only problem is not ice. I like talking about ice. I like mountains, but that's not the only problem. One of the biggest problems is water temperatures are rising at a faster rate than ever before. I was diving in the Mediterranean this summer, roughly 6.2 degrees warmer than average. 6.2 degrees. Essentially, it's warmer than a bathwater when you go into the eastern Mediterranean. What happens with that? Well, you lose species. You lose diversity. All I could see were lionfish and pufferfish, two invasive species which have no predators. They eat and destroy everything. They have no economical value. And this is the new med. That beautiful, beloved med full of species is now actually dying. Retreated water, retreating waters are revealing dinosaur prints in the US. You know, these are all novel things. But then look at Pakistan. Look at the floods. Everybody looks at Pakistan and says, the monsoon, wow, they have lots of water. It's not the case. They get so much water in such a short time that 1,000 people die from flooding. Destroys people's livelihood. There are 200 million people that live there. And guess what? The rest of the year, they have to live through drought and they don't have enough water to actually feed their agriculture. And at the same time, what's happening with this global warming 
Demand for appliances is increasing every single day. Today, there are about 3.6 billion cooling devices in the world. What I mean by cooling devices, air conditioners, refrigerators, freezers. 3.6 billion. Sounds like a huge number, right? If you think of the number of people on this planet, 3.6 billion is a huge number. Well, guess what? By 2050, it's predicted that there will be 14 billion appliances. 14 billion. We cannot cope with the energy demand of 3.6 billion cooling appliances today. How are we going to cope with 14 billion in the future unless we change completely our energy mix and the energy efficiency of these appliances? This demand is going to come from very densely populated places. My beloved India, where we have a partnership, where growth is going to be exponential in cooling appliances. Or uh, Bangladesh, or Sub-Saharan Africa, or Indonesia. These are countries which will experience such growth in energy demand that there's no way today's energy mix can actually fuel this. I'm not trying to be too dark. I'm going to share quite a few facts with you, but I do have hope. Huh? Please listen to me uh, uh, with that in mind. I will share some facts with you, though, which I think everybody needs to keep at the forefront of their minds and run their everyday lives by. Fact number one, we have to get to a net zero future. We have to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. These are a must. Nothing else matters unless we get these targets right. And it's not going to be your children that is going to do this. It's not going to be your parents. And do not expect your governments and politicians to do this either. You have to do it. We have to do it. This is our responsibility. And believe me when I say this, in the future, they will look at our generation, because all of this destruction has happened in our generation, one generation. They will look at us and say, you did this. And I, don't, I certainly don't want that. So I am doing everything I can, but I think each and every one of you have to do this too. That's fact number one. Fact number two, this is an urgent issue. It is not tomorrow's issue. 2030, which is when COP26 set most government and company targets to actually decarbonize economies, businesses, consumption. 2030 is only 380 weeks away. 380 weeks. That is nothing. At Archidic, what we do, at the end of every week, we look at everything we did that week. Investments, product platforms, and we say, what did that do to our carbon balance sheet? Have we increased our carbon footprint? Have we decreased it? And by tracking it every week, we are aware of the urgency of the issue because we're going to run out of time. We have committed as a company to reduce our emissions by 50%. Not our emissions, by the way. I'm going to get to this. This is important. I'll leave it for later. Third fact, efficiency. Energy efficiency is actually the only quick solution if we utilize fully that we can get to this 1.5 degree future. I'm going to talk about this, but this is where the appliance industry, and I don't just talk about the appliance industry. I mean electronics, anything that consumes power in the home, and you can add mobility to that too. But today I'm going to focus on the role of the appliance industry. Now, I bet you've never heard of Jevon. Jevon's paradox, he was an economist who lived about 150 years ago during the Industrial Revolution. So think of the steam engines coming up, coal becoming very popular. Um, when the fossil fuel journey started, and the world really started building up quality of life, well, he actually saw that the UK, use the UK as an example, and by the way, I'm sure you've all seen pictures where London was unlivable because of smog due to coal, right? I mean, uh, that's actually the first environmental climate-related disaster uh, that, that our generations before had to deal with. But this Industrial Revolution brought with it this fear. Britain thought it would run out of coal because it was using so much for its trains, steam engines, Everything, essentially. Automobiles, you know, every, every, every kind of steam engine, that uh, manufacturing processes, the textile mills, yarns, endless list. And as they feared running out of coal, they created much more efficient steam engines, much more efficient trains that used a lot less coal. Well, what Jevon saw was that actually, in the end, by making everything so efficient, the total consumption of coal went up because it started getting used everywhere. This is something very important in today's world that we don't think about it. I talk a lot about decarbonizing. I fight to decarbonize Archidic, the industry. I talk about global warming. But actually, if we reduce that to nothing, we're going to face another problem. So we need to be mindful of Jevons' paradox, an economist 150 years ago. 
I'm going to mention two other names, Kazum and Brooks. Interesting names, by the way. Brooks was a climate skeptic, actually. Um, but he accurately predicted that nuclear needs to be a part of any energy solution, any energy mix solution. He was wrong about the climate, but he was right about the energy mix. Kazum took uh, the paradox and brought it to today's world. Basically, if you were able to reduce, uh, they scaled it to today's world. If you were to reduce um, the cost of energy and the use of energy per unit, then it would actually make the society far richer in terms of quality of life, and in total, much more energy would be used. We need to be very mindful of that. So when I see energy costs of today, inflated energy costs of today, I look at it uh, uh, in a way that I hope this actually continues, not for the reasons of war or energy scarcity or because we want to change the source, but because the true cost of that energy is far higher than what has been changed, charged in terms of fossil fuel. The only solution here is a carbon tax, pricing that carbon into every product that's made if we are continuing to use uh, fossil fuels. So what I'm trying to point to is there, there's a very painful tension between our energy conservation goals and actually our environmental goals. And the problem is far more complex than we think. By decarbonizing, we don't actually solve the entire problem. Now, the home appliances industry has developed well over the past couple of uh, decades. We've made more eco-friendly appliances, consume less water, but the number of appliances in use are continually going up. If you take my earlier example of 3.6 billion to 14 billion, you understand the enormity uh, of this problem. So as, of course, the number of appliances grow, so does uh, the consumption of energy. Now, why is this a problem? Well, the chair you're sitting on, the shoes you're wearing, the glasses you're wearing, this screen, everything is made from materials on Earth. We haven't learned yet to mine meteorites, other planets, everything comes from here. But somehow, I blame the economists again, not Kazum and Brooks, but other ones, our forefathers who actually wrote economic theory, they gave no value to nature. The market uh, system we operate under today, the capitalist system demands, basically demand and supply determine the price of something. If there's scarcity in supply, like chips, the price goes up. We know this. How come we can consume nature endlessly and there's still no value attributed to it? We need to make sure that whatever we take from nature is priced into the price of that commodity or product so that we can preserve the future of uh, nature. This is um, a, a problem which is actually going to become bigger and bigger. Let's assume for a second that we find nuclear fusion or green hydrogen. That means free energy for everyone. Not just free energy for everyone. That would mean if you have free energy for everyone, you can desalinate water. It means you have free water for everyone and you can pump it everywhere. Let's assume for a moment that we achieve this as humanity. We may end up destroying the world if we don't also look out for forestries, fisheries, agriculture, uh, ecosystems, biodiversity. We need to learn to look at nature and the world as a whole. And to do that, we need to assign a value to nature. I worry that in a world where you have free energy, you will have unlimited travel, you will have unlimited consumption, and that's already the end of the world. And another problem we don't talk about, of course, um, uh, which is a little bit of a taboo subject, then you have unlimited amount of people also, if everything is free and easy. So we need to make sure, I think, personally, as societies, we get used to elevated energy costs, but the money is not going to oil and gas companies, is a carbon tax that actually goes into the product's price. I don't believe in a world where people can get richer and the planet poorer. This is not a quality of life equation. We need to make sure we are looking at it much more holistically. Now, of course, what do we need to do? Can we actually get richer? Can we live better without destroying the planet, without Earth being poorer? We can. We need to decarbonize. We need to electrify everything. It makes no sense we need to preserve water. Water is a huge issue. It doesn't make any sense, as I said earlier. I'll give you an example. I think it's going to be easier. Elon Musk, everybody knows him. Fantastic entrepreneur. In our world, success is determined by wealth. He's the wealthiest man in the world. He's a visionary, true visionary. His stated goal is to go to Mars, 
right? Well, if we keep going as we are now, aiming for a richer planet, a richer people, poorer planet, basically we're going to turn Mars, we're going to turn Earth into Mars. You're all going to get there before he gets there. And this is happening way faster than you can imagine. We're beyond the turning back point. We need to all actually focus on this problem. Now, I'm going to share a few solutions to the problem. I'm not just an alarmist, right? We're doing something about this. And we're at an appliance industry conference fair. Uh, I should talk a little bit about the role of appliances in this. Uh, but actually, it turns out that the role of appliances is far bigger than any of you can imagine. I'm going to name four product groups, and I'd love for you to remember them when you leave this place. ACs, refrigeration, electric motors, and lighting. Okay? ACs, refrigeration, electric motors, and lighting. These four product categories consume 40% of all power in the world. All power. Now, think about the technologies available in terms of the efficiencies of these appliances, and think about how they are today implemented. They are not used today. If there is a cleaner technology available, it should be mandatory that all of us use this. So there's a massive amount of responsibility uh, on our industry. Think about how the world has changed. You know, radios, cassette tapes, VHS, they all disappeared, right? Calculators, cameras, they digitized, came into our pocket. Well, actually, washing machines won't disappear. We can't digitize them. They're, they're actually using physical, they're doing physical work. They will require energy input. But we can also always imagine washing machines that um, do not use detergent, do not use water, can use ultrasound, can use peptides. There are many solutions we're working on. We need to accelerate these, not to mention much less steel, much less um, metal. You know, there should be no plastic. I mean, uh, you know, either it has to be biodegradable plastic or it has to be recycled plastic. There should be no virgin plastic in any of our products. Basically, we need to not only change every appliance to become the most energy and water efficient, but we actually have to electrify everything too. Heat pumps, extremely promising. No one talks about heat pumps. I'm astonished. Actually, the UK is a good example. They just announced a 5,000 pound per home uh, dividend support, let's call it a support for um, transitioning into heat pumps for heating and cooling. Today, only 7% of the world uses heat pumps. It could be 90% of the world. The amount of energy that saves is phenomenal. So essentially, there's so much more we can do uh, in terms of creating efficiency for these four uh, categories. What are we doing at Archidic? I mean, we're an appliance manufacturer, so actually we bear a lot of this responsibility. We're carbon neutral in scope one and two emissions, right? And we've been this, and I've been very proud. I've been beating my chest speaking about it. Well, you know what? It means nothing. It is absolutely nothing. Because scope one and two emissions, carbon emissions, are only 2% of RGX emissions. 98%, and I'm, I'm rounding up numbers a little bit. I'm looking at my team over there who's saying, no, not 98, 97, but never mind. Say 98% scope three emissions. Scope three means what your appliance consumes in terms of energy and the emissions that causes while the customer is using it in the lifetime of that product. This is, this is the only thing you should be asking manufacturers about. This is the only thing you should look at the product when, you, when you're deciding what product to buy. And there we have committed to reduce it by 50%. How are we going to do this? Well, in the past 10 years, we've made massive gains, right? We've reduced um, you know, the consumption of energy by washing machines three times, water 20%, dishwashers 50%. Basically, we've really attacked and made this a priority for us, a way of life, and we have created the most efficient appliances. And the net zero target for 2050 actually helps us along uh, this efficiency drive. But actually, water efficiency is something else that we all need to be working on. I mean, I started by talking about drought in Europe. Uh, the value of water is such that we need to save it every possible way. I even told you not to shower or take a cold shower, right? Um, now, uh, what we have done here is we have actually managed with the dishwashers to reduce it down to 6.9 liters. But something which should have been done for such a long time, and just is starting now, I don't know why, half the water is saved in the dishwasher from the previous wash and used in the next wash. 
And if you multiply this by millions of appliances, this makes a, a, a real massive uh, difference. I'm not trying to sell you anything here, but allow me to show uh, a short video which will allow me to also uh, catch my breath on uh, our water saving appliances. If you can start the video, please. Does Beko's new Save Water line make a difference for you and the planet? Little by little, watch how it adds up. More and more. Little by little, the water we save adds to something bigger. Beko's Save Water line gives back a total of up to 7.8 litres of water at every cycle to you and the world. The tumble dryer stores clean water and transfers it to the washing machine's next cycle, while the dishwasher collects the final clean rinsing water and reuses it in the beginning of the next cycle. Together, offering perfect washing results. Beko Save Water. Every cycle saves a little and saves a lot. Here, um, I mentioned the dishwasher, but actually the dryer washing combo is also amazingly simple, right? The dryer end product is a lot of water, while the dryer now saves that water and actually uses it in the first cycle of the wash uh, for the next wash you do, which is very, very simple when you think about it, but saves enormous uh, amounts uh, of water. One more thing here, it says top three in Europe, but uh, you know, we all see the same data in the industry. Beko, for the first time, is actually the number one brand in Europe in terms of units, MDA6. And I really credit that result to our sustainability uh, leadership. We're also uh, partnering with water.org and helping out in Africa, taking clean water to places where it doesn't exist. Right? This is a cliche. We all want to help, we hear it, we see it. Well, guess what? We're doing it because each and every single of 50,000 employees at Archidic knows what it's like now, because of this project, to not have clean water. What is the result of that? Each and every single one of those people do whatever is in their power to help actually save water, bring technologies, innovations to save water. What I'm trying to say is just uh, talking about energy efficiency, water efficiency is not enough. The company needs to build purpose, and we've actually, I believe, managed to do this. Now, we're one company doing this. Is it enough? No. I'm suggesting the whole industry needs to do this. But how is that going to happen? Without regulation, I think it's very, very difficult. Applied standards and labeling is critically important if we're going to actually manage to hit our uh, uh, climate goals as a global, I mean, world, not just governments or, or companies. It's unfair for companies who do the best they can and that impacts them negatively from a cost perspective in the markets they're competing. We need to have a level playing field. Without a level playing field, without an adequate carbon pricing mechanism, a carbon tax mechanism, we're facing an uphill battle. Voluntary action can only take us so far. Um, so what are we doing about this? Well, I became elected, as uh, David mentioned at my, when he was introducing me, I just got elected uh, uh, as president of APRIA, which is the European Appliance Association. Now, it was a close vote, 11 to 10. I didn't lobby for it, actually. I didn't want it. I didn't have time. But uh, the reason I was elected was simple, uh, with such a close margin. Half the industry doesn't want to change, right? It, they think it will cost them money. They think it will uh, be a disadvantage to them competitively. Well, the other half of the industry realizes that if we don't change, they will change us. And what I intend to do as president of APIA is to push for much, much more stringent energy regulation, much more stringent water regulation, and make sure that clean technology and every efficiency technology available to us today is actually the standard we produce everywhere in Europe and sell everywhere in Europe. The same needs to be, by the way, my friend Dr. Choi from uh, Samsung runs the US Association. If we can manage China uh, and Asia to come on board, we could perhaps make this a global fair regulatory environment, level for everybody, same playing field. This is actually, I think, critical in reaching our industry's goals. Um, there are no easy wins. You know, Jevons' paradox tells us we solve one problem and then we create another with that, right? We need to solve for increasing amounts of appliance in the world, more energy consumption, 
uh, while we're decreasing energy consumption everywhere. But actually, solutions are possible. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol came together. Many of you probably don't know this, but I'm sure you've all heard of the ozone layer depletion and the hole we had, uh, and how that would be the end of all humans, you know, it wouldn't stop the radiation anymore. Well, guess what? In 1987, the whole world came together and regulated and banned CFCs. And CFCs left our lives very quickly with no loss to human uh, quality of life. And the ozone has slowly been healing and closing that hole. Now, it takes 70 years. It's not happening immediately, right? It's 2050. They predict that it will be pre-1980 levels. But still, the solution is there. We've all been part of the solution, and it was a global solution. We need to do the same when we're talking about decarbonizing and energy efficiency. Europe's winter is just a few weeks away, right? I mean, it doesn't feel like it out there. That's global warming too, by the way. But soon, winter is coming. And we know it's going to be a very rough winter. With the cost of energy, heating is going to be an issue. What are you going to do? Are you going to tell your children to wear their ski clothes and sit in the living room and not turn the heat on? Because that's what my, many people are going to have to do. Um, instead of debating where the gas comes from, who we're buying the gas from, like politicians are today. We really need to do this for the sake of the planet. We need to move away from uh, fossil fuels. We need more nuclear in the mix. Germany is turning on its nuclear reactors. This is the right decision. We have to reduce energy consumption, and we have to change the energy mix. Otherwise, we're in trouble. But that's not the only thing. The cleanest fuel in the world, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about it, is not nuclear is not green hydrogen. The cleanest fuel in the world is the fuel, the energy we don't use. And we all collectively have a responsibility to actually make that a reality. We have to do it. Um, policymakers, politicians. The US just passed the Inflation Reduction Act. I love the name, you know, Inflation Reduction Act. But underneath it, was the biggest climate bill that's ever been before. 367 billion, I think, earmarked in incentives and investments to move to a cleaner energy source. But in there, there's, there are a few secrets. One is they actually changed the description of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere from emissions to pollution. You may not think that's a big change, but it's a huge change. By making it pollution, they have reduced the ability of courts to overturn reduction in methane, filtration requirements, uh, methane from animals. They suddenly, basically, uh, by changing the description, really made a lasting policy change. And they also earmarked a huge amount of money, by the way, for energy efficiency, for appliances, and for the energy transition. This now, Europe with the Green Deal, I used to call it a good deal, while well, Europe's deal now looks tiny compared to what uh, the Biden administration has achieved. And I don't believe that it can be overturned easily with the Republican government again. I think this is there to stay, because everybody sees what's happening in the world, and people are reacting with their votes also. Now, my own journey. Um, uh, yeah, David already made a, <laughs> a big deal, <laughs> made a big deal out of climbing Everest. Yes, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Maybe you know, I was very. Uh, ignorant in that choice, in not knowing exactly the risks, maybe, which became apparent when I was climbing. But what people didn't understand is what I was trying to do was trying to get people to ask a simple question. Here's someone who has a job, looks like a dream job, big global platform, CEO, three young children, happy family. Why on earth would he take a risk to his life? Why would he do something like that? Because when you speak about sustainability, your motives are not immediately apparent to people. They don't understand what you're trying to do. Some people think you're trying to gain a business advantage. Some people think you're trying to get a, a personality advantage, you know, grow your own image. Actually, all I was trying to do was to get people to listen to me. And that authenticity led to Archerik and all the team members in the company to actually follow very carefully the whole preparation process, understand what sustainability meant, understand what was happening to the planet. And then when I actually came back, after very, very difficult moments on the mountain, I found that the company really had purpose. Because when we spoke about sustainability, it was no longer just talk. It was no longer just a vision statement. Every part of the company has been trying to decarbonize and decarbonize as fast as possible. And of course, with that, 
a lot of recognition comes. We lead the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, the Terracotta, Terracotta Seal from Prince Charles, the list goes on and on and on. And guess what? Consumers today are really responding positively and they are actively choosing our products because we are the most sustainable appliance company out there. Um, I also uh, ended up writing a book. Um, I'm not selling the book. I was earlier trying to sell you a dishwasher, but now the book, I can give it to you for free. It's, there's a box of it somewhere over there if you're interested to read it. I would suggest you read it because, well, the people that, who have read it um, have reviewed it uh, as a great source for information on not just the climate, but also what's happening to our fisheries, food chain, um, and other areas, forest fires. This, is, this was a place I visited, the whole forest burned, very, very sad, and the trees turning. People think that you can stop fires in the Mediterranean. You cannot. It's climate change. It's not, it's, of course, it's human-driven. If you get the maximum temperatures that are increasing that we're seeing, it's all going to burn. There's not going to be any forest left. I mean, I'm talking 10, 20, 30 years. Anyway, I don't want to be too dark, but I was born in 1972. I'm turning 50 in a few days. And uh, 19, sort of 1950s, I will be 80. My, uh, my kids will be, you know, in their 40s. What kind of a world do you want to leave your kids? Please imagine for a moment how old your kids will be, how old you will be. It's not an abstract date, it's within our lives. And I told you earlier, history is going to hold us responsibility for what happens. So what do we do as responsible leaders today? Are you all okay with the current path with going on, which is a richer, richer people, poorer planet? Or are you like me and you want richer people and a richer planet? Thank you for listening. Um, we do have time for a Q&A if you've done the whole QR code thing. Ah, yeah, definitely. Lots of questions. Okay, but there's also a microphone here in case you want to ask questions. If energy efficiency is the best way to make a difference, how do you make sure this is accessible to everyone across the world? By Ashley is asking this question. Very simple. This is why we need regulation. You know, <laughs> they call me all kinds of things, but uh, it's not common that a leader in an industry which produces things from materials calls for more regulation. Normally, a businessman's instinct is to reject regulation, to fight regulation. This is one area where we absolutely have to have level regulation all across the world to ensure access for everyone. Now, the question you're asking, I understand very well, is that that regulation will drive up costs for emerging markets where people may not be able to afford that extra technology. That's why we need to have a system where the North subsidizes the South. Climate change has no borders. What you do in India and Pakistan is going, to affect, um, is, you, is going to affect you in Sweden and Germany. That's fact. So if you want the quality of life in Sweden and Germany, you are going to help subsidize cleaner appliances in emerging markets which actually need it. You cannot tell people in India, Pakistan, to not consume appliances. That world doesn't exist. They will consume appliances. Do you know how many times more there are wet bulb moments now? Do you know what a wet bulb moment is? This is something quite interesting. If you get ambient temperature above 31 degrees Celsius and humidity above a certain level, which is, I, f I forget now, but I think around 65 or 70 percent, what happens is the human body cools by perspiring, loses its ability to um, cool itself down, and you actually die. The number of times, and they call that the 50 degree moment, it's called a wet bulb moment. If you and the number of times this has been exceeded in places like Iran, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of uh, near Asia, it's staggering. More people are dying from heat than you can imagine. Now, that's dying from heat, but let's talk about the quality of life under that heat, right? They are going to consume air conditioners. That's it. It's a human right. So we are going to have to pay for more cleaner air conditioners. Anyway, that's my view. Uh, Philip. Treacher, I know companies can help customers by providing energy-efficient products. How do companies help customers improve the way they use the products? Um, Overconsumption trumps efficient products. I agree. I agree. There's a lot for the industry to do. I saw some good stuff here. You know, with connectivity, um, with online, actually new programs being uh, loaded onto appliances over the life cycle of that appliance. 
with the use of that appliance being monitored and maybe gamifying with the consumer a little bit how that appliance is being used, there's a long way uh, that can be, uh, a lot that can be achieved. Now, our responsibility as manufacturers is not only manufacturing the most efficient product, but it's also making sure the appliance is being used correctly. And that includes educating the consumer, I agree. But I did tell you to turn off your appliances if you're not using them, right? Uh, Josh Breton, if the world continues to change, how can we make sure that companies stay agile to the unprecedented, unexpected changes that arise in industry and society? Well, we just lived through a pandemic. Um, two years of shutdown, meltdown. Uh, but we're going to see a lot more of this, right? If, if we continue uh, with the current trajectory of heating, um, I mean, I don't like talking about it much, but, you know, we say one and a half degrees, two degrees. If it's two and a half degrees, we can... Some scientists, CPCC, predicts you know, three, three and a half degrees as human extinction. So you can imagine what will happen in one and a half to two degrees warmer world. Resources will be impacted, transportation will be impacted, consumption will... I mean, it's a disaster. I mean, uh, my lifetime was about experiences. Uh, you know, I worry about maybe the size of the house I live in. I mean, I don't like cars, but you know, the bicycle I care about. But my children may have food security issues. They may, they may have trouble getting a roof over their heads. The world seriously can go in that direction. I mean, we haven't even talked about um, refugees and what the climate will do in terms of refugees. The numbers are staggering. I mean, we're talking about a billion refugees. One billion. Look what happened to Europe with one million Syrian refugees, right? We have four million in Turkey. It's a strain. But imagine one billion people changing places. These are unprecedented times. So. Um, we really need to take action now when we are not living those uh, problems. And I, I don't think industry and businesses will be able to cope with this very well. Uh, that's why we need to do our best to clean up our act now so that we're not held responsible later. I'll use one example. If you, Archeric today is aiming for around 50 megawatts of solar power generation, right? We're not a power company. 50 megawatts is a huge number. Uh, Literally, it's a huge number. It's power company generation numbers. Why do we do that? Because we know that every surface we have, every factory in the world, needs to be covered with a solar panel so that we are generating the power we are using or our consumer is, is, is uh, using. This actually is hedging the cost of carbon in the future. Today, you can buy a carbon credit for 80, 90. Maybe in 10 years' time, it's going to be 800. Maybe it's going to be 8,000. Maybe it's going to be 80,000. It depends on the state of the world. If businesses want to cope with that future, they need to actually decarbonize now, and they need to decarbonize fast, because the penalty of not doing that will be extinction. They will be out of business. Kai Keune, I apologize the pronunciation. Focus was on the footprint of the power consumption. What about carbon footprint of production? Um, how will you set focus on circularity? I talked about those, actually. I mean, we're carbon neutral in our production. We, yeah, we were. Now we chose actually to focus on the much more important goal of scope three reduction, uh, which is decarbonizing the use of our products phase. We, we, our production phase only uses 2%, uh, causes only 2% of emissions. So, yes, we are attacking that, and we've, that's why we are now a solar power company, essentially. Uh, circularity is a big issue. I believe in it. Uh, everything should be recycled and reused. I mean, we have finite amount of materials in the ground, as I said. Everything we take out, we need to reuse. But that doesn't mean our products should live on forever. Uh, if we replace refrigerators that are 10 years old, we're going to save so much energy, it really is worth, as long as we recycle the old appliance. So for me, actually, uh, uh, circularity has a completely different meaning. I mean, it has to be taken in view of the cleanest and best technology available today and the cost of that uh, as well. Wang Xion Li, any specific plan about housing materials, plastics for your devices? How do you switch virgin to other options? Well, we're increasing the amount of uh, recycled plastics dramatically, but I don't think that's enough. We need to use bioplastics, and I'm glad to see many examples in the fair where companies are now starting to experiment with biodegradable plastics. I mean, uh, our R&D teams, I remember giving them I think five years ago, a goal, saying, I want to buy a fridge from you, and I want to bury it in my garden, and when I dig two years later, I don't want to see the fridge there. They said, impossible. <laughs> but of course, we've made a lot of progress. I mean, 80% of the fridge will be gone, let's say, soon. Uh, so we need to keep pushing the boundaries and use new materials and definitely increase the amount of recycled materials. Monica, 
Great to see companies addressing freshwater issue. What are examples of the regulations you would encourage governments? I, I, I basically want governments to regulate to the best available technology. So they will look at all appliance manufacturers, find the best available technology, and regulate to that. Years ago, uh, three years ago, here at IFA, at actually almost to the date, on this stage, I announced a new technology, which we basically our fiber catcher, meaning our, we equipped our washing machines with a filter that captured more than 90% of the microfibers that are discharged into our water systems with every wash, right? It was a big thing. What I did is, I said, this, we're open sourcing this technology. We want all our competitors to use it. We want governments to regulate. California is regulated. France is regulated. But you know what I'm really proud of? Almost every single competitor of, our, of ours in IFA over here is showing some kind of microfiber filtration technology. So talking about it actually works. And if we all want to do the right thing, then all of us are going to have microfiber filters in these washing machines. Not because it's our problem. It's the yarn industry's problem. It's fast fashion's problem. It's not the washing machine producer that has anything to do with that pollution. But if we can do something about it, we need to do something about it. And I'm really proud to see that everybody is now deploying uh, this technology. Shi Shen says, what's your plan for the Chinese market in the next three years? Why don't you open a flagship shop on Alibaba Tmall? I think, I think we have one, uh, actually. We're there. Uh, we are in China. We've been there a long time. Uh, we're also, uh, as you know, we bought, maybe you don't know, but we bought Hitachi's businesses outside of Japan uh, last year. And uh, the Hitachi brand is quite prevalent in China. So is Grundig and Beko, actually. And we plan to grow our presence. We have a factory there. But, uh, you know, China is not doing itself favors with the COVID policy. I hope that disappears soon. I talked to China this morning. I was told there's an expectation, even though Chengdu is closed, hard to travel internally at the moment, that by November, uh, the policy will change. I hope my team is right. That would mean I can go there more often and actually uh, be more active in, in the growth in China. <clears throat> Wolfgang Weber, what should EU policymakers do specifically um, as long as US and China don't impose a CO2 price? Well, uh, look, I think uh, CBAM is an important topic and we can talk about it all day, uh, but what I do think is we can't wait for everybody to act uh, at the same time uniformly. Europe has always been a great example, but Europe is 8% of global emissions, only 8%. So what Europe does can only be an example to the world. But let's be an example with CO2 too. Why not? So let's tax it. Let's create efficient markets. Article 6 in COP26 addressed this problem, right? It, 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 it prevented double counting on behalf of firms and countries. It laid the groundworks for a freely functioning carbon market. And we need to put that into place now. And that has to happen fast. Because I personally, being very deeply involved and passionate about this topic, I don't see another solution other than a tax on carbon. And we all need to advocate this as industry, not be against it. David Slalai, sorry. How will you be able to convince other players of the industry to follow your example? Well, I don't think I need to do that. I think consumers will do that with their wallets. Consumers are going to choose companies, services, and products that have done the right thing and decarbonized. I mean, if you are living in 50 degrees heat and you know why it's happening and you can differentiate the company that's doing the right thing and the one that's not, I think it, uh, it becomes pretty clear that you're willing to pay a little bit more. And we're seeing this, by the way. We are seeing consumers beginning to pay more for cleaner products and services. So this trend will continue as the younger generation has no tolerance for the way we've been treating the world. Jack Hargraves, how would you suggest societal culture changes in order to stop the dramatic climate shift we're experiencing? The issue is people-driven. Well, we need less people. I mean, that's clear, right? We need more education. Um, we need more awareness. But most of all, we need action. We need action by our leaders. We need to take voluntary action. We need to be passionate about it. Uh, in my own life, I try to make the choices I make as carefully as I can. I try not to use single, pla single plastic. I try not to eat as much meat. Every decision you make has an impact. And slowly, slowly, I believe this correct behavior will change the behavior of people around you. As they see you're authentic and believe you, this behavioral change will continue. But societal change, unfortunately, uh, requires 
a shock to society, right? But I believe we're living that shock today with all of the things I talked about, all of the images you saw. And as that intensifies, I think humans will change uh, the way they behave. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. I truly enjoyed being here again. It's an honor uh, to be speaking at IFA twice uh, as a keynote speaker. In between, we were closed for two years. Let's see if, I, if I'm invited back next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>